wherever you are in your life, know that you are there for a reason. Picture this. 20 years ago, I was living in a campground outside of Seattle with little more than my clothes, a friend, his two dogs, no job, and no place to live. All I had was a degree. Four years before, I almost didn't go to college immediately after graduating high school. I worked hard and I did my homework and I was ready for a year off to think about what I wanted to do with my life. I was 22 and believe it or not, I'd already tried several different things through jobs I'd had. I worked a bunch of retail jobs. My mom was an accountant and my dad was a lawyer, so I helped them in their offices. I worked in an auto body shop helping to restore new and old cars. I loved the feeling of accomplishment I got from that work and it fueled a lifelong passion for classic cars. I still dream of restoring a 57 Chevy. Another job I had was at a yogurt shop and I remember the pride I felt when a cake I had decorated sold immediately after I put it in a display case. I found I really enjoyed seeing the fruits of my labor, so I wanted to try as much as I could to see what interested me. Well, my parents convinced me to go to college, and off I went to U of I. As the second oldest of 10 kids, I usually did what I was told. They said not to work, just concentrate on my studies. Turns out that's the worst thing I could have done. Now that I had all that extra free time on my hands my freshman year, I did everything but study. For the first time in my life, I had the freedom to do anything I wanted, and I did nothing. It was awesome. <laughs> I went from thinking I would major in engineering because I like math and science to accounting, since I seemed to have that attention to detail. During my sophomore year, I saw an ad that the student newspaper and yearbook were looking for photographers. A light bulb went off in my head. A high school teacher who recruited me to take yearbook photos had told me he thought I had an eye for photography and I should pursue it if I was interested. I was hired and quickly realized how cool it was to be surrounded by others my age with a common goal and we relished scooping the local daily newspaper. I worked my way up from an assistant photo editor for the college yearbook to the co-photo editor for the student newspaper. I found myself a few feet out of bounds taking photos at home basketball and football games. That's me in the bottom left corner there. I was even feet away from popular stars taking photos of their performances during concerts. Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails. But I also saw the other side of the news spectrum. While processing film one night with another photographer after covering a sporting event, we heard a residential fire call over the police scanner. We both rushed to the scene, but when we got there, it seemed like everything was over. Suddenly, we heard shouting and the breaking of a window, and we saw a child being handed out of the opening to the arms of an awaiting firefighter. Another was quickly carried out the front door to an ambulance. It all happened so fast. Adrenaline kicked in. I didn't have time to think about what was happening in front of me. All I could do was look for the best shot. I later learned that the children had died, and the reality of what I'd seen and photographed and what was now appearing in print hit me. I later heard that some people were upset about the photos being used, and I heard the topic ended up being discussed in journalism classes on campus. This experience made me realize the power of photojournalism and telling stories through images. During my last summer at college, I wanted to absorb as much as I could before I left, so I learned the ropes as a page designer to see how pages were prepared for the printing press. By then, I had my degree in business administration but I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I guess I would move back in with my parents till I figured it out. Then an old classmate called and wondered if I wanted to pick up and go to the Seattle area. I asked where he had found a job. He said he hadn't. I asked where he thought we'd live. He said he wasn't sure. Again, my parents had an opinion about my decision. They didn't think I should go, but I wanted to know what I was made of. So I did something I had never done before. I took a big risk. Two weeks, that's how long my friend and I spent in that campground outside Seattle. Since we didn't bring a generator, I switched from using an electric razor to razor blades. To this day, that's what I use. We eventually found a place, and the person who assisted us gave me contact info for a photographer at a local weekly newspaper. Seeing that I love the creativity and travels that I experienced while working in the field in college, I thought, why not pursue it either full-time or as a freelancer? 
Freelancers do the same work as full-time photojournalists. They just get hired on a job-to-job -job basis and don't have any of the benefits of a full-time job like health insurance. I got busy networking, but photojournalism wasn't the only thing that interested me. My dad was a police officer, and I always liked the concept of putting your safety on the line to protect those around you. So I applied to be a Washington State Trooper. Networking paid off first. After landing an internship at the Sun in Bremerton, only later to learn because their first choice didn't have a car, I received a notice that I passed the first round to be a Washington State Trooper. But by then, I just couldn't pass up the chance to work for a daily newspaper. I was sent out on a supply ship, an aircraft carrier at the local Navy shipyard. I had my first chance covering pro sports too, and I even got to photograph a Chicago legend. I spent my whole life in the Chicago suburbs, yet the first time I was able to see Michael Jordan play was when the Bulls played the Supersonics, and there I was with my camera, only a few feet away from the action. I was so proud to show my family and friends the photo I took of Aaron Jordan himself. As my time as an intern was winding down, a photographer who initially thought my work was mediocre, and I couldn't blame him, I was so green, commented how much of a pleasure it was to see me grow as a photographer. Maybe I was on the right track after all. Unfortunately, the paper didn't have a full-time spot for me, but they did recommend me to a sister paper in Destin, Florida. I was offered the job over a payphone in between assignments. The managing editor said I didn't even have to fly out for an interview as my coworkers had such great things to say about me. I had never heard of this Gulf Coast vacation destination before, so after he clarified that if I had never been to the Bahamas, this was the next best thing, I told him to sign me up. Nearly the next two years of my life were spent minutes away from white fine powder and blue-green water. I was the paper's first full-time photographer, so any time a photo re request came in, I was the one to go. A new middle school opened up during my time there, and I went to every single event. One of the sports programs even recognized me at their end-of-the-year banquet for my photo coverage of their team. Now the pride I felt was knowing my images were appreciated by those in the community I lived and worked. Since tourism relied on the fishing industry, I was told I can never take too many fishing photos. That was cemented in my mind when a coworker asked if she could turn one of my photos into a painting. Here I had gone from the Emerald City to the Emerald Coast, probably two of the best places to find fresh seafood in the country, and I didn't care for it. Probably from growing up eating fish sticks baked on a cookie sheet. <laughs> Though it took me a year to really settle in, I quickly found I relished the time I spent on the beach, not just to fish, but for meeting people from all over the world and hearing their stories. Because I was the paper's first full-time photojournalist, I had complete freedom to work assignments at will, yet I had to learn to speed up my workflow as just about every photo that was published in the paper went through my hands. That didn't bother me at all, as I loved being involved throughout the entire process. It was overwhelming, but it also made me feel important. Once again, I realized I was the eyes and ears of the community I covered. My portfolio grew with solid community photojournalism. I'd gone to Washington to find out what I was made of, and I was making a living doing something I enjoyed. But I missed home, missed my family, and wanted, wanted to know if I could make it in the Chicago market. I didn't make it there first without having to work for a paper outside Rockford. Let me tell you, the interview for that job made up for not having an interview at my previous paper. It just about lasted an entire day. I was closer to home, but Freeport, Illinois is still a world away from Chicago. Interesting that one of my most memorable photos there occurred when I captioned a photo showing what I thought was ducks. Well, they were actually Canada geese. I had voicemails from members of the community that ranged from people laughing at my mistake to one person even screaming, get your waterfowl right, as they hung up the phone. <laughs> I suppose I was happy people were still noticing my work. An inquiry into an ad to work as a freelancer outside Chicago ultimately led to my next full-time job. Though I was located at a suburban newspaper, my work also ended up in the Chicago Sun-Times. I was on cloud nine. What I saw through my viewfinder was shared, was, was shared with tens of thousands of readers. Plus, I was able to cover all Chicago sports teams. Then 9-11 happened. I had one routine business assignment that day before getting a call to find any local reaction, which included a local church where people were praying. That night, I watched the news coverage of the aftermath and rescue efforts in New York. 
Like many Americans, I was moved by the stories of selflessness and bravery of firefighters and police officers. And once again, I found myself drawn to a career in law enforcement. This time, I found myself in a police training facility after passing the final segment to become a Chicago police officer. I was two weeks away from reporting to the academy. My gut led me to ultimately decline the offer. Through a friend, I got an opportunity to make a video of a local hip hop artist, and that opened me to the world of video. You mean instead of capturing a moment in just one frame, I could now capture a moment with movement to the footage, and I could use audio and other techniques to tell a story? I was hooked. The newspaper I still worked for wanted to add videos to their website. I jumped at the opportunity. I partnered with a reporter, and we thought the best way to drive people to the website was how-to videos. We pledged, that, we pledged to work on one a week for a year. One of my editors commented that, it was, that he was impressed that it looked like I used multiple cameras, though I only had use of one. I loved doing video, but I wondered whether anyone was getting anything out of my work. That's when the web editor informed me that a college in Texas wrote him to say they were using a video we created on how to score a ball game to teach members of their ball club. I went on to create short narratives whenever I had the chance. I was finding it hard to watch a movie and not analyze camera angles and pacing. Along the way, I also learned that all this traveling I'd done, all this experience was leading me somewhere in my personal life too. One day I covered an assignment in which a reporter was writing about learning to fly. She hid her fear of flying very well not only did she have a similar passion for telling stories, she loved the oldies and understood me. In 2007, we got married. I was finally working in the Chicago market and just in time because in 2008, a senator from Chicago was elected president. In January 2009, I traveled to Washington DC to cover the inauguration of Barack Obama. Once again, I was the eyes and ears of the community attending a huge historic event. There's a reason I'm not showing you any pictures I took of the president at his inauguration, because from where I stood in the freezing cold, by the way, wondering if I was going to lose a limb, he was a teeny tiny speck. <laughs> Things were going great for me, but all wasn't well in the newspaper industry. Circulation and print advertising revenue was down and revenue from web advertising and digital subscriptions wasn't enough to offset the losses. No one performed, any, no one performed only one task anymore. Photographers learned how to create photo galleries for the website. Reporters started taking photos when staff photographers had more pressing assignments to cover. Our office was closed and most of the staff began working remotely. I submitted photos from the front seat of my car, the local library, or really any place that had a chair and a power outlet. After years of witnessing my friends losing their jobs because of cut budget cutbacks, it was finally my turn. In 2013, I was one of 28 photographers let go as a company decided reporters with iPhones could do our jobs. Though I was receiving calls of condolence from family and friends who heard the news, I welcomed the change, but I was scared. In some ways, I was right back at that campground, wondering what would happen next. Would I find another job doing, doing photo and video, or would I take a different path? I had already begun freelancing for higher education institutions. I had finally realized there were other organizations that wanted to showcase their own stories too. I believe my photojournalism background gave me an edge with my current job as Moraine Valley's videographer. I'm sure you've had someone ask what you want to do when you grow up, but is that even the right question? They should be asking what you are passionate about. That will keep you moving forward and motivating you along your way, no matter the odds. Wherever you are in your education, whatever your plans are after you graduate, know that getting your degree is only one part of the equation. You will learn from everything you do along your journey. I didn't realize learning about customer service, prioritizing projects, and interacting with people would help shape my entire career path. I was so distracted trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grow up that I almost didn't realize I was living it. My passion is telling stories. Don't be surprised if you see me in a welding class, though just in case I ever get that 57 Chevy. Thank you.